Friends, uh, it's very good to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. And this is uh, another video in my series, Bringing the Word to Life, which I've been doing uh, sort of on and off over the last couple of years. But after a bit of a break, um, I've decided to do a change of format. So whereas previously you just had me talking to camera, to you, uh, I'm going to try a bit of an experiment this. And instead of me talking about the Bible passage for the coming Sunday, I'm going to be having a conversation. I'm having a conversation with my friend James. James, uh, welcome. Nice Thank to you. have you with us. Thank you very much indeed. It's good to be here. Uh, James, we've known each other a little while, haven't we? Uh, yeah, um, I think it's about 31 years, um, about 1990. It is, that's right. So 31 and a quarter years, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. we're now in 2022, remember? Yeah, we are, keep forgetting that, yes. <laughs> How did we meet? Well, um, we met when I went to train for the ministry at St John's College, Nottingham. And I think I was about a year behind you. You were already there. And I drove my car into the college car park. I got out of the car and you said hello and called me by my name, which was a bit of a shock. And it turns out that actually you've been assigned as my senior student. Um, Link you, student, I think they were called. Yeah. What were they called? Link students. Link student. Okay, not senior. We weren't, we weren't, weren't we were very egalitarian, weren't we? We were very, very, very uh, egalitarian. Link student. And uh, you had had a, a photograph of me and perhaps some bio, I don't know. Um, and you'd obviously done your homework. I had, and those, this is the days before the internet, so I couldn't just yeah. look it up on Facebook or anything, so I yes. had, that's great. Um, now, you're, you, I live in Nottingham, but you don't, do you? And hence no, you. I, I'm just a figure of two churches just north of Cambridge, um, mm -hmm. on the outskirts of Cambridge, Histon and Impington, mm -hmm. uh, and I've been here about um, nearly 16 years. Wow, and it's a good place to be? It's a fantastic place to be, yeah, um, very exciting place to be, and uh, two, church, two churches, two villages that have basically merged, and a, a church in each in each village yeah great well uh, this sunday is lectionary reading is uh, epiphany are we epiphany two or epiphany three i should know that it's epiphany two it is epiphany two i'm, I'm ahead of myself already <laughs> and we are again in the lectionary looking at um john two mm. uh, verses one to eleven which is the, the the fourth gospel's account of the wedding in cana and the miracle of water into wine uh, i know there's been a bit of a discussion online about why we're looking at it again because um we actually had this reading this time last year in the anglican lectionary although actually the ecumenical revised common lectionary had a reading from mark so mm. i don't know have you preached on this passage a lot many times yeah <laughs> it, it seems um one can't say too many can one but one does seem to come around incredibly frequently it, um, it does, yeah. it does. Yeah. Well, 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 by the end, we'll see whether we've exhausted it or whether there's, there's more to say. I, I, I suspect I know what the answer to that is going yeah, to be. Yeah. Um, perhaps we can just begin by, um, I'd be really interested to know from you what, uh, how you feel about preaching on the fourth gospel. Yeah, that's a really interesting question, because I think when I was first ordained, I found John really intimidating. I mean, it's a gospel that we all know is immensely rich in all sorts of ways, not just symbolically, but relationally in, in, in so many ways. As I've got older, I, I relish it now because I think it's so, so wonderful to just look into it, to gaze into it. Mm. And it's definitely a gospel you need to live with over many years. It's a life gospel, really. And it reveals its secrets and its, its um, insights mm. so much more as you live with it year in, year out. And actually, so preaching on John 2 many, many times is probably really helpful, actually. Does that mean it's your favourite gospel of the four? I don't know whether I could say it's my favourite. Uh, I have, of course, you know, you know it's like favourite hymns. One has lots of favourite hymns. And <laughs> I, I have lots of favourite Gospels. You know, I love Mark. I love Luke. I've, I've grown latterly to love Matthew. Um, so, you know, it's it's right up there, though. It, it would definitely be, you know... Um, in your top four, that's for sure. <laughs> exactly, in my top four. <laughs> well, let's have a look at the passage. I've got it on the screen in, in front yeah. of me here, and I suspect you have the same. We, we are twin screen people, aren't we? Yeah. Um, and uh, I also I posted my commentary again um, on um, just a couple of days ago. So I, I, I guess it'd be interesting to start by saying, you know, what is there particular that sort of either leapt out of you from the passage itself or that struck you from the commentary uh, that yeah. I offered? I don't know if there are particular yeah. things that, that came out for you. I think the thing that particularly struck me is, is this whole question about the um, six stone water jars and whether they're, you know, they're symbolic of something. But also, I think the whole thing about, I mean, I'm an ex-engineer, so I was fascinated by how they're manufactured. Oh, and right. the idea of the Roman lathes, um, which I think Richard Borkham has, has done the research on, yeah. 
yeah. is really amazing. I have a lathe in my own garage, um, a metalworking lathe. Right. And, yeah. and I was thinking about the kind of mechanics of turning a large lump of stone yes. into a water jar. Yeah. And, you know, what the sort of dimensions of that would be, uh, the, yes. the weight of it, all that kind of thing is fascinating. I, I, maybe we'll get onto this, but I've done a few little calculations about about these jars. And I, I think that's have you? Quite, quite revealing. Yeah. Um, well, go on, hit me with your calculations. This is really interesting. Well, I mean, this is what, this well, is what well, happens well. when you do theology having done engineering, isn't it? <laughs> well, I thought, first of all, I wanted to know how big they would be. Um, I think uh, 30 gallons is about 140 litres, nearly 140 litres of water. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, as you know, a mathematician, you know, if you're, it's, let's, let's model it as a cylinder. Mm. Um, pi r squared h is the volume how high would they be how how what how wide would they be you know what's the what's yeah. the dimensions of it and then the, the next thing is how heavy would they be yeah. yeah and i think these were probably um jars which a family would not have moved around very yeah. often i think they'd have been yeah. static in a corner of the house yeah. and you would have gone in and you would have um poured water from a jug and ladled it out and what ladled in this instance wine out of it yeah they were static and i think um that kind of rather um helps the case that the six is simply a piece of factual evidence rather yeah. than yeah. anything symbolic yeah. because you know you anybody who knew that house would know that they were always six joint and they always had been yeah. and you don't go and then manufacture another one because manufacturing is really difficult yeah so it's not like if they had been clay jars for instance where one might have got broken you might have made one and a spare the number might have changed around this would have been a pretty yeah. static number so that that's the kind of insight that um, the, the calculations do. And how did you work? I mean, sort of how big? Yeah, I reckoned that somewhere, depending obviously on the diameter, but somewhere between 70 centimetres and maybe, maybe 1.2 metres high. Right. Um, okay. Something of that order. And I think that fits with the pictures that you showed on your blog. I can't remember. What I, I did. Yeah, because there are actually in uh, if you go to the burnt house excavation in Jerusalem, you actually see the, precisely these kinds of jars from from the period. Right. Um, and, and for me, I think there's two sources of that. One is, as you mentioned, that I mentioned Richard Borkham's paper that he gave at the Tyndale New Testament Conference, which people can sign up to, actually, very soon. Uh, we're meeting again yeah. in June, um, talking about the historical reality of the situation with the distributed uh, priestly families. But, but also, um, I every year try and get to, I haven't the last couple of years, try and get to the Society of Biblical Literature Conference in the States, which is a kind of global yeah. um, Anglophone conference. And there, there has been for several years a strand in that called John Jesus and History and I remember Robin Linus who used to be a professor here in Nottingham gave a paper about precisely about the stone artifacts and, and the technology that was needed to produce those. Yeah. Um, of course one of the things that I noticed is that in if we're, if we're taking the the mention of the six stone jars as simply a reference to historical reality we are swimming against quite a strong tide of commentary Mm. Um, I mentioned, I've forgotten who I mentioned at first. Oh, C.K. Barrett. So yes. this is the, uh, uh, when we were at a college together, this yes. is the commentary I picked oh, up. Pretty same soon. edition, yeah. And, uh, you know, he, he makes a comment. He says that the, 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 the symbolism of the six, it's seven minus the one, that humanity was created on the sixth day. Uh, this shows, he says, the imperfection of the Jewish dispensation. Mm. And I don't know how... How you felt about that kind of reading because that's the sort of thing that you you find quite commonly in sort of online sermons yeah it feels a bit obscure to me and it, it feels i think particularly the, one of the interesting things is that john um it, it's, it's difficult with numbers in john isn't it because i mean I, in a sense numbers up to about 10 or 12 um you you know that generally you know that there's all sorts of things that come come in small numbers yeah. the bigger numbers in john like the 153 which richard balkan talks about the 38 um with the uh, the man at the pool and mm -hmm. and, and those those numbers they, they those are more i think they're easier to map onto some kind of symbolic reference mm. or clearly john is presenting them in that way mm. um whereas this one it doesn't seem to be quite so um they're, they're these smaller numbers are not quite so easy i mean are we going to sort of decide that every time the number two is mentioned two disciples or something that's symbolic or something i, I think that's a bit yeah. that's a bit i think the other thing that struck me is that there's this um which you mentioned in your in your blog is that there's this um difference of opinion about whether this is the sixth or the seventh day and and i think it's just struck me that if this was the sixth day and then it's six stone water jars that would be a better case for saying yeah. that John is labouring the number six, but I, yeah. I think the ambiguity of the of the day of the week and the number of days we're into kind of 
doesn't really reinforce the symbolic meaning for me. Um, mm. I've probably preached to them in the past that it was a, it was symbolic, but I, I haven't. I honestly haven't yeah. previous <laughs> sermons. Um, but, you know, one's, one's view does change, but I don't think I would labour it now because I don't think there's enough no, evidence. It does raise a very interesting question about how do we discern, particularly in this fourth gospel, but it also applies to the others. How do we discern when they are making sort of symbolic or theological? significance to uh particular comments and how how do we distinguish that from just that you know well it just it just happened like that and i think we're, we're confronted with this particularly in the fourth gospel because there are clearly occasions where where the writer says something factual and it clearly has huge symbolic significance i mean i think for me the most striking one is the most the most overt one is in um, chapter 13 verse 30 where uh, jesus is talking about the one who would betray him and then Judas goes out and, and, and the gospel writer says, and it was night. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you know, you could, yes, it was night. It was the deepest, darkest night in human history. You know, yeah. Yeah, okay. It was actually nighttime. The sun had set, but yeah. this is, this is where the one who is the light of the world has been you know, sitting in front of Judas and, and he cannot see him for who he is. So this yeah. is really the, the, the darkest night. And then of course, in the following chapters in chapters three and four, we, um, uh, we fact the fact that Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night on the one hand and of course you know again Nicodemus can't see and on the other hand um, he meets the woman by the well in the middle of the, in the middle of the day and uh, I, I don't doubt that Nicodemus did come to him at night because in the cool of the evening is when you would come and meet another a, a rabbi and you'd, you'd have discussion uh, and clearly for the woman at the well she was socially marginalized she wasn't collecting water at the time when the women would have done it in the early morning before the heat of the day yeah. and yet we have this kind of um, overt implied symbolism because the woman sees clearly who Jesus is, and yet Nicodemus is still in the dark. As, yes, as we would say. yes, 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 absolutely. And I mean, it, 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 I think one of your commentators on, on, on one, one time you blogged on this suggested that the uh, in relation to that John four story of the woman at the well, that the you know that, that was a, that was the seventh uh, the seventh water jar, but of course it wasn't stone because she wouldn't have been able to lift it. Um, That's so true. Had, had, had the jars of John, I knew there was a good answer to that. <laughs> had, I think had the jars of John too been yeah. been you know earthenware or pottery of some kind, yeah. Yeah. that might have held some. That might have made the six significant in John too. But I think the fact that they're completely different kinds of water jar used in completely different ways, um, rather rather also kind of um, tells you. I don't. I don't think it. it and, and in all this, I think we are beginning to touch on things. I don't think we'll dive into it now. We're touching on the question of. When we're preaching on a text, are we preaching the text? Are we preaching what's there? I hesitate to say in the intention of the author, because there's a whole minefield there about whether it's the author's intention that shapes what a text means. Are we doing that? But I think the basic discipline is, are we looking at what the text says? Or are we using the text as sort of a jumping off point for our own theological imaginings? And I think yes. there is quite a strong tradition of that happening. I mean, I do mention Augustine's exposition of this, and he... Now, I, I feel ambivalent because I don't agree with Augustine's reading of the text, no. but he still says something which seems to be really important, which is which is which is there. So he, his comment is that he talks about actually history being in, in six ages. He doesn't use the word dispensation, six ages, and the jars correspond to the six ages. And of course, now we're in the, the, the seventh age. Um, some would argue that Jesus brings the eighth age. Actually, it's the end of history and yes, part indeed. of the age yeah, to come. So, but, but he does say, he said that these previous ages and all the, all the law and all, the, all that's gone before, and you know, even though there is prophecy, would be as empty vessels unless they are filled by Christ. Now, I wouldn't want to disagree with that. I would say, yes, exactly so. That, 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 that a Christ-centered, a Christological reading of Scripture says that unless we see all that goes before as in some way or other leading to and, and finding its fulfillment in Jesus, then we're missing something. But then you see, I suppose one of our, our tutors at, at college, John Golding, would say, you know, actually the Old Testament does say all that already on its own. Yes. He, yes. he, asked, he asked a provocative question, do we need the New Testament? Yes. I think and, we do. And it, it feels like trying to shape the, the current text to fit in with a scheme that is already kind of existing in the mind of Augustine. Yeah. And, and yeah. as you said, of course, I, the, the other point here, of course, is that the, the remarkable um, thing about scripture is that it's been able uh, to speak to people in every culture and in every age. And, mm -hmm. and despite, you know, that there's with, with different schemes of inter interpretation yeah. that Augustine dealt with, you know, because, I mean, the, the early church is very, very, much into symbolic reading of pretty much everything, wasn't it? Yeah, indeed. I mean, that, yeah, that was quite indeed. a strong strand, and and, yeah. and we wouldn't we wouldn't do that now 
Although, of course, the question then for us is exactly the one we're discussing is how much is actually symbolic mm. Um, and, and how much is, is something to leave behind. But I think there's always that temptation to use, and I think I hear it a, a, a lot, actually, in, in preachers, particularly those who are setting out, that they use the text as a springboard to, into something that they want to say. And, and it's, it's a really important discipline that we learn to allow the text to set the agenda mm. and, and allow the text to speak and expound it in that way. Yeah. Well, let's go back to the text itself, because we actually, we, we mentioned this before, but it begins with on the third day. And that does seem to be significant to me because we, we've had a series of markers in, in chapter one that, that something happened then on the next day, on the next day, on the next day. And I think I am persuaded by yeah. any Mark Stibby's reading. I mean, I, I mentioned that Stibby and Barrett disagree on exactly how you count. Yeah. Um, but it, I've noticed as well that um, I've recently been looking at Joanne Bryant's um, commentary in the Paideia series as well and she she sides with Stibby on this but but there's a, there is an interesting implied symbolism here because of course if the moment we mentioned third day we are thinking about resurrection it's the end of this the week of the first creation and and, and then followed by Jesus resurrection although again it doesn't it doesn't match up exactly does it because in theory resurrection happens on the eighth day doesn't it not the seventh yeah yeah, yeah. Um, that there is something there is something there in terms of anticipation um and and that seems to correlate as well with the the, the wedding symbol here we're, we're at a wedding yeah. now again it, it seems to me that there's there's um, intimations of symbolism here it's not it's not an allegory no. because if if it was now if this was a, this was a f sort of allegorical anticipation of the um the wedding of the lamb in revelation uh, 19 and uh, 21 um then jesus would be the bridegroom of course he isn't yes, yes. Uh, so there's a very interesting Point. I think. I think once again in, on on your blog about um, the whole question that um, Mary puts to to Jesus, or the whole the, the statement, you know, um, when she says they have no wine, implication, please do something about it, and he uh, and he, he he does do something about it. But it was always the bridegroom's job to do something about it. Yeah. So in a sense, Jesus is taking the place of the bridegroom. I thought yeah, okay. that actually was quite a convincing um, mm. uh, argument. It, it seemed to me, and and actually makes sense but you once it, it's really interesting because you have to do the historical hard graft to understand mm -hmm. the yeah. the cultural context that that that, that comes mm -hmm. in um and that that was that was really really helpful um one, yeah. one of the things that we've had a bit of a debate about online the last couple of days actually is is i, I happen to mention in the detailed commentary at the end of the second half of the piece that um we shouldn't pay too much attention to the fact that mary isn't mentioned by name and people have sort of pushed back a bit on that. It is. It did strike me that she's just referred to as the mother of Jesus. In other yeah. words, she derives her importance from her relationship with Jesus. Now, yeah. I know I need to be a bit careful here because as an ex-Roman Catholic who, <laughs> who's crossed the Tiber in the opposite direction to the direction some people are going in these days, yes. Um, yes. I, I have found it quite striking. Actually, this was in a Grove booklet recently, which did some character studies in the Gospels. And it pointed out that by Cor Benema, who's at London School of Theology, it points out that when you look at the Gospels all together, um, Mary overall doesn't get a particularly good uh, portrayal. I mean, yeah. we're so used to the, you know, just having come through the Christmas season, um, the uh, Magnificat and Mary's humble response and all that kind of thing. But, but here, uh, it's, it feels to me as though the character of Mary in this episode is actually pretty ambivalent, because on the one hand, she... She, she she offers in one sense a model of a response to jesus because she says in verse five i was very struck by this just reading reading it again today do whatever he tells you well isn't isn't that the archetypal Perfect. response of a disciple you do do what jesus tells you and you know of course that's picked up later in the gospel jesus says if you love me you will obey my commandments on the one hand on the other hand she doesn't she's not even named no. uh her relationship is the important thing is that she's mother of jesus and um, I've got a slight confession, which is that uh, for some years, my dear, blessed late mother, uh, some years where this is my favourite verse in the Bible in one translation, mother, don't tell me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, she doesn't say this, he says woman. Don't. Yeah. Um, so, you know, his response, and, and I just mentioned this idiom, what is it to do with you and me? And if you look at that idiom from yes. the Old Testament, it's actually yes. pretty, pretty strong rebuke. Yes. I mean, uh, there's a very, very interesting comment that I think Bridget Bagley makes in her Grove book on st um, studies of um, Jesus' encounters with women in, in John's Gospel, oh, yeah. um, where she she says that the, the way this whole encounter is articulated um, is, is designed to help us understand that Jesus is moving away from 
responsibilities to his earthly mother to be to clearly be obedient to his heavenly father and the way in which the dialogue is structured enables emotional distance between the two of them um, and of course what has to happen in that distancing is that she has to move away from being the mother of jesus to being the disciple of jesus and therefore the the statement that she says do whatever he tells you is her having made that move and now modeling what it means to be a follower that and, is really fascinating. And I yeah. thought it was a really great insight from Bridget. In that, in that, uh, comment, yeah, yeah. Bridget, who actually lives in Nottingham. Yeah? Of course, yeah, 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 of course, Bridget. just up the road. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that, is, that is really interesting. Um, I was about to say something else that just struck me as you were talking about that. Now it's gone, it's completely gone. <laughs> don't, don't worry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. We, can lose, we can lose that in the edit, <laughs> he, he says, hopefully. Um, oh, yes, I know what it's going to say, is that, um, that, that, that actually, that break with kinship and the move from kinship ties to gospel ties, of course, you actually see explicitly in the other gospels. So, for example, I'm most struck by the one in Matthew chapter 12, where, you know, again, a, quite a negative portrayal of Mary and, and, and where his mother and his brothers and sisters are at the door of the house. Yes. And they say, yeah. hey, you know, yeah. it's got a bit mad. They want to come. Yeah. And people say to him, your mother and your brother and your sisters are calling for you. And he says, who yeah. is my mother, my brother, my sisters? Those who do the will of God. In other words, those who are listening to yeah. his teaching. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that in the church today we need to take much more seriously than I think we generally have done, um, that, that actually the body of Christ is the family uh, of God. It is it, we are we are that those are that is our new those are our new family ties. Actually, yeah. That yeah. our loyalty yeah. and is, is yeah. to those who are believers in Jesus. And we need to model that somehow um, much better than I think we often do. It's interesting that that theme should come out in, in this gospel because one of the things that is very striking about the fourth gospel is that the disciples don't actually mm. do much and yeah. they don't play much role they they aren't if they aren't introduced it's almost yeah. as if the writer of the fourth gospel thinks that assumes that we've already read one of the other three yes indeed. Probably mark we don't yes. um because they're just the 12 are introduced without any explanation whatsoever um and in fact, one of the things I noticed here, and it varies across different English translations, I've got three English translations open in front of me alongside the Greek here, and um, Jesus was also invited to the wedding and his disciples. The, the NIV actually smudges that a bit because it says Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding, but it's yes. actually very clear that it's Jesus who's been invited, and I think I comment on this on the blog. Do, yeah. Jesus, Jesus is the guest. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, the disciples tag along as well. Yes. Now, they're, they are significant because at the end, of course, they become the witnesses to yes. the manifestation yes. of his glory but it, it does strike me again that very typically of this gospel you, you get a focus on very often actually on jesus and one other person you get this sort of this yeah. this this zooming in this almost uh, cinematographic sort of zooming into yeah. just those two characters and i i wonder whether that's one of the things that makes this gospel feel quite sort of intimate it, it sort of draw, draws you in uh because you, you see close up and personal as it were jesus encounter Yes, it's almost as if the, the disciples at the beginning are, are tagalongs, and then by the end, they find their identity in, in, in being witnesses to, to Jesus. Yeah. And, and, and I think there's a, that's an interesting shift for us just to think about as well, isn't it? That it is. you know, it's so, mm -hmm. so many of us are, are looking for our, our identity, and, and as Christians, we want to affirm that our identity is found in our witness to Jesus Christ mm -hmm. and in mm -hmm. relationship with him. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. We talk quite a lot about the jars. Yes. I, I, I was, again, really interested in your observation that the jars can't be moved. And again, something that struck me in rereading this text is Jesus says to the servants, fill the jars with water. Yeah. And they fill them to the brim. And, and you know, just sort of mentioned just like that. But of course, that's going to be get a leather bucket, go to the well. Yeah. Uh, Multiple, it, times. Back, Multiple yeah. times. So, you know, we're all sitting there twiddling our thumbs waiting for it to happen. Um, but also, there, there's an interesting that comment to the brim is interesting, isn't it? Because, um you know, if you're, when you're going to draw it, you, you wouldn't normally, as I think you make this point, you wouldn't normally fill them to the brim. Yeah. But when you, if you do fill it to the brim and that becomes wine, and you then need to go and collect the wine, you're going to put a jug or something into the, you're it's going to spill, spill over. The wine's going to spill over because yeah. simply, Ar, you know, Archimedes and all that, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just your and, physics background again. It's so useful. Yeah, you see, it's it so, so important, isn't it? <laughs> and, and I think that's a, more of that abundance is, is, is there <laughs> in that sort of mental image, really, that in, in a sense John is conjuring up for us. It by the is. way he tells the story it's a little it's a, just an intriguing little detail they filled them up mm. to, to, to the, the brim, brim. Mm. Uh, having said that I, mean, I make the point that there isn't any explicit link made i mean verbally there's no link between that idea and you know when we get to 
John no. 10, Jesus says, you know, I've come to give you life, life in all its fullness. But nevertheless, yeah, there is, a, as you say, it conjures that image up in, in, in your mind, as you imagine it, which again is another argument for saying, look, you know, what matters here is the, is, is what happened and, and John drawing, yes. drawing us into um, the actual event. Uh, they tasted it, the master of the feast tasted the wine now, uh, now become wine. Um, well, somebody speculated that it was only as the servants carried the water from the jar to the steward it became wine. I'm not quite convinced about that. No, uh, I've heard that. I've heard that said. Um, oh, have you? Yeah, but mm. I, 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 I don't think there's anything in the text to sort of tell no. us about that, really. No. But again, it's interesting, as you said, paying, going, paying attention to the shape of the text itself, because again, um, people often contrast the Oh, oh, the water, oh, a bit insipid, all oh, the wine, wonderful, and, and that's the contrast. Again, culturally speaking, I don't think anyone in the first century would say water was unimportant or water was boring, because if you live in a very hot country where there's not much rain in the summer, and you, you've got to have a well or a system, we've actually got both here in our house, funny enough, but right. we've also got plenty, plenty of water in the garden and the guttering coming, coming, and the rain coming down and so on. Um, but actually, it's interesting that the, the text... Uh, reaches, as it were, its climax in saying the best wine. You've left the best wine till now. Mm. Um, and there is, again, that seems to me that fits in with the, the, the repeated trope that, and I think we find it earlier in the gospel in, in, in chapter one, where, again, the contrast is not saying Moses bad, law, boo, Jesus yeah. good, gospel, hooray, actually saying that we've received grace upon grace. That is that, that God was gracious to his people in the gift of the law. God is gracious to his people in... Um, setting them free from Egypt and leading them through, through the wilderness, the promised land, and so on and so on and so on. But that grace comes in a super abundance in the person yes. of Jesus. And it seems to me that's the, the, yes. the focus at the end of the, of the text here. Yes, and, and that's indicated not just by the, the quantity, but by the quality uh, as well. Isn't yeah, that, yeah. That, that it, it's the best. Yeah. It is, yeah. yeah. I, the, just the last sort of point on the text there, I was again struck by um, this is a really interesting little phrase. This, the first of his signs... So on the one hand, you know, there's this there's this common um, uh, description, I think, in the scholarship that uh, this gospel is a gospel in two halves. So the first is the book of signs. and The second is the book of glory. But actually, because, of course, in, in particularly in the last of a discourse, you know, Jesus talk, in his high priestly prayer talks about, you know, the glory. Now's the hour of the, when, when, when my, the, my glory will be revealed and uh, glorify your name and so on yeah. in chapter 12. Um, but, but here in this verse, you actually have the two together. So, again, it's just worth mm -hmm. noticing that dividing the gospel into two halves doesn't always work exactly. No, so no, the no, first no. of his signs, and of course, this one is numbered, number one, and, and yeah. the, par the, the paradox is that the later signs aren't numbered. Oh, in fact, they aren't even called yeah. signs. Um, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee. So here, again, you've got a specific place reference. This is a, 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 a one level, a relatively mundane event is a wedding. He's done something extraordinary, but only the servants know how it's happened. It's interesting, isn't it? The yeah, steward yeah. and the bridegroom don't. And yet, in the mundane reality of ordinary life, where Jesus comes on and comes in and does something extraordinary, that's when his glory, you know, the transcendent glory yes. that he had with the Father before all time, yes. is manifested yes. in the sort of back working room of a yes. house, priest, maybe a priestly house in a little village up in the hills in yes. Galilee. And, and, and almost secretly, in, in a sense, as you say, yeah. not everybody can, knows about this. It's it's yeah. a yeah. it's this kind of secret glory, but it's kind of being revealed but not revealed, and and it, it's it is fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. manifested his glory, uh, revealed his glory. Yeah, manifest in the ESV, revealed in, in the NIV. But again, you see, interesting, isn't it? It's a revelation, but it's not a revelation, as you say, yeah. because it's revealed yeah. only to certain people. Yeah, so there is an insider, an outsider. Yeah perception there as well which of course becomes such a huge theme in in john yeah, yeah. um just to finish with i don't know out of that sort of discussion and reflection is there anything particular that you take away from the passage and that you particularly want to take into preaching about this yeah um that's a very good question and i think you know over the years one's preached different angles on this passage uh, mm. inevitably because I mean, I've preached the same congregation for almost 16 years, so they, they don't want to hear the same thing as I preached last year on it. Um, Assuming uh, they can so, remember, of course. Yeah. <laughs> well, I always, assume, I, I slightly arrogantly always assume they do remember, of course, but um, <laughs> I, 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 perhaps they don't. Um, I, I think the, the thing that struck me particularly this time is, is this whole thing about the abundance, uh, uh, about, uh, about the quality and the quantity of, of the grace mm. and the glory mm. of God. Um, which is revealed in Jesus, and mm. and that's something which 
really many people need to hear today. I think it's, um, we, we kind of think that God is sort of just kind of giving us just enough, you know, um, or, or maybe not even quite enough. And, mm. and that's mm. around a lot in the, in, in the kind of Christian subculture, really. Mm. And I think a lot, of, a lot of us need to hear that God is wanting to pour out his, his super abundant grace on us in mm. order that we can be transformed to become the people that he wants us to be. Uh, and it's made us to be, and that, that's something that I think I would I would pull on. Um, as no, that's really. Speaking. Thank you. That's really interesting. You can also say you. Yeah, you I, I think I think two two related things for me coming out of the passage is I think that um, I'm just really struck by this gospel's relentless focus on Jesus as being central. So it's Jesus and his disciples. It's Jesus oh, and his mother. It's yeah. Jesus who commands the servants it's jesus whose glory is revealed and of course yeah. in, in the glory of jesus we see the, the glory of, of of father god as well um and uh i think um related to that it's the fact that jesus has done something i was talking just to uh, i was in discussion with somebody the other day about you know is it important that these things have a historical background because of course there's a tradition within particularly liberal scholarship, critical scholarship of saying, well, it, we, we can't believe any of this stuff really happened, but, but it's, it's, it's sort of parabolic, it's, it's just sort of metaphorically true. And it seems to me that I am persuaded by, by Tom Wright and others who say, look, the word gospel means it's an announcement that something has happened. Yes. And in this conversation, I said to them that we've got a tradition of prayer in the Church of England. I think I was talking to an American saying, called the collect. And the collect says, the classic form of the collect is, almighty God, you did this thing in the past. Will you now do this for us again today? Yes. And I think for me with this, this uh, the, the reason why I think some of that historical context and drawing us into the reality of the situation is important is it, it says to me, yes, there was a place yes. and there was a time yes. when Jesus who walked this earth turned water into wine. He, he took what was necessary for life and he turned it into something even yes. more extraordinary. And that because he did it then, Yes, he can do it again now. Yes, and, that, and it's really interesting that, isn't it? That, that, that of course, this uh, this passage, the other place we always preach on it, or very often preach on it, is at weddings, it is and when we want to be yeah. able to say, Jesus was at. It says it in the in the Anglican no, marriage service. Yeah. You know, um, at, at, at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. You know, it, it, it's it's put there. But it's often the Bible reading as well, and we want to be able to say to the couple in front of us, the, you know, the same Jesus who actually attended a real life wedding. Mm is with us now by his spirit. And mm. it's no good if this was just a symbolic story because yeah, it, it yeah. Kind of, the whole thing falls apart. I think yeah. um, it, it's, and it, and it's very, t it's, it's a very powerful thing to preach on at a wedding. Mm. James, thanks so much for Not joining sure. me in the conversation. Sure. Yeah, and yeah. I uh, thank you, uh, the viewer for, for joining us, uh, for watching. I hope that our conversation has helped for you to bring the words, the word here in John 2 to life. Um, if you've enjoyed this, then do make a comment below. If you've got any observations, join in the discussion either here or on the blog. Uh, do subscribe for future videos. If this works, if people like it, James, we'll do it again, won't we? I think we will. Yeah, sure. Very much like to. So yeah. see you in future weeks. Great. Thanks very much.